Ports of Call. Beyond blue horizons, far at the world's end, strange, fascinating lands beckon us. Bid us revel in their exotic splendors. Come with us as we head for Ports of Call. Sprawling eastward across the face of the earth, from Europe into farthest Asia, lies one-sixth of the world's landmass. A violent country, a fascinating country, a sociological laboratory, the like of which the world has never before seen. This is Russia, our port of call. An 18-hour rail journey takes us from the Russo-Polish frontier to Moscow, the capital of the Union of Soviet Socialistic Republics, as Russia is officially known today. Here, amid the bustling activity of the most socially-minded people on earth, Amidst modern apartments and modern ideas, we find the physical reminders of the old Russia, of holy Russia, the land which lay sleeping in superstition until the violent hand of revolution shook her awake. Here in the Kremlin, the city within the city, are the domes and spires of the ancient churches and palaces, which today house the government. Here is the gorgeous cathedral of St. Basil, bringing up memories of the first Tsar, the terrible Ivan, who, the story goes, blinded the eyes of its architect that he might never duplicate its beautiful spires. Ivan the Terrible, who massacred his subjects by the hundred thousand, begat two sons, one an imbecile, the other an historical enigma. Ivan died. Boris Gudinov, an aristocrat of the court, seized the throne from Feodor the imbecile, sent Ivan's wife, the Tsarina, to a convent, and murdered Dmitri, her son. For more than ten years, Boris Gudinov reigned as Tsar, and then, one night in the summer of 1605, as he sits alone in his palace in Moscow, Basmanov, his faithful friend, brings him news that shakes his insecure throne. Now, my dear friend Basmanov, what are these tidings that bring you here with a face flushed red as borscht, a breath coming in gas? Terrible tidings, oh. Majesty. Well, speak, what is it? A man has appeared in Poland who claims to be Dmitri, the son of Ivan. Dmitri Ivanovich died at Uglis ten years ago. As I remember it, he fell upon his knife while at play. My messenger reports that the imposter is, is identical even to the two warts which disfigured the young Tsarevich's face. Dmitry Ivanovich lies buried in the church of St. Michael. I believe, Your Majesty. But will the people believe it? Even now the Polish nobles are planning to give this imposter an army to gain back his throne. Say nothing of this, Vosmanov. Nothing. No one will believe the fantastic story of this crack-brained imposter for long. <laughs> But the noblemen of Poland did believe the story of the man who claimed to be Dmitri, the rightful Tsar. The king of Poland backs him in exchange for his promise of the gold of the Kremlin and the conversion of Russia to Roman Catholicism. Within a few months, Dmitri is leading an army toward Moscow. Boris Gudinov, in terror, summons the Tsarina from her convent, tells her what has occurred. She listens intently, a smile of satisfaction on her face. And this imposter explains himself by claiming that the son of a serf was substituted for him by his physician, and that he had been taken to a monastery where he was educated. Ah, it is fantastic. 
But perhaps true. Probably true. True? You too believe it? But you saw the boy's body. I did. And I know who killed him. Yes. I know that you suspected that I sent Manchuski to do it and that you aroused the people against him. But that's beside the point now. Dmitri is dead. Has been dead for ten years. You recognized the boy's body as your son's then. I want you to testify now that this Dmitri who marches on Moscow is an imposter. What good would that do? The people still remember Ivan. They will flock to the banner of his son. But if you, his mother... Tell them that this imposter is not Ivan's son. They will believe you. You think they will? You are his mother. Of course they will believe you. But perhaps I was mistaken. Perhaps my Dmitri lives. Perhaps this man is my son. What do you mean? I mean that if this man were the devil himself, I should acknowledge him as my son if I could repay you for the misery you have caused me. So the people will believe me. Then Boris Gudanov. Your days on the stolen throne of Russia are numbered. The bitter vengeance of the Tsarina did its work. Her public acknowledgement of the mysterious Dmitri as her son paved his way to Moscow. At the head of an army of ferocious Poles, before whom the awed Muscovites melted in superstitious fear, Dmitri enters the city. <laughs> The palace is ready for your majesty. I have two scores to settle first. Bring to me those two men who've stood in my way almost since my birth. Your majesty, Boris Kudinov drank poison, even as you were riding through the gates of the city. Cheated me again, did he? And it would have been such a pleasure to have tortured him. And where is Shusky, the traitor whom Gudunov sent to murder me? Prince Shusky has been captured. They're bringing him to you now. Sir. <laughs> your Majesty, Prince <laughs> Ivanovich, I was a friend of your father's. Yes. And a friend of Gudunov. You who would have murdered me. No, no, I swear it by the sainted towers of yonder cathedral. It was you not I. You lying, that... crawling, wheedling wretch. Kerensky, you're not. No, no, no. Give it to me. I shall beat him myself. No, no, your majesty. Majesty! Oh, you would call me majesty! No, no. You who would have murdered me! No, no. Regicide! No. Traitor! No. You learn the vengeance of a sire! Kaninsky. Your majesty. Your sword is sharp? Yes, your majesty. Cut off his head. No, no, for the love of God, no, Dmitry Ivanovich. I am but an old man. I loved your father as I loved Raise you. Raise the sword high, Kadinsky. Make certain you do not miss. No, 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 no. See, I, I crawl to your feet. I kiss the hem of your gown. <laughs> Kadinsky, return your sword to its scabbard. So, so you would kiss the hem of the gown of the man you once thought to murder. Very well, Shusky. I will spare you. Your Majesty, may God bless you and smile upon your reign. Yes, I will spare you, that you may spend the rest of your life in Siberia. Siberia? Oh, but I am an old man, sire. I should never live to reach Siberia. I should die of cold on the way. No, 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 no. Better that you kill me now. Kedinsky. Yes, sir. Prince. Shusky leaves for Siberia at once. Yes, Your Majesty. I will have the cart brought. No, 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 Your Majesty. Blessed Father of Holy Russia, do not send me to Siberia. Kill me now. Let the sword cleave my head from my shoulders now. Let me die in the glorious radiance of your person, not on the cold steps of the north. Ah, you babble like an old woman. The cart is here, sir. Good. Place Prince Shusky in it and see that it leaves immediately. Yes, Majesty. Sire, consider what you are doing. Consider how faithful I was to your father. Oh, I have served Holy Russia. Kill me now. Kill me now, but do not send me into exile. To Siberia. I have spoken. <laughs> I have changed my mind, Vasily Shusky. I will not send you to Siberia. Not to Siberia? No. Then you will behead me here. No. Not behead me? Not exile me? 
And your majesty is thinking of the torture your father devised. The cauldrons of hot oil. Oh, no, sire. No, not that. Send me to Siberia, I beg you. Behead me, but not the hot oil. Silence! Your babbling wearies me. I will not behead you. I will not exile you. I have decided to pardon you. Oh, thank you, sire. Thank you. Yes, and make you my valet. Prince Shusky, the valet to the Tsar? Why not? What say you, my friends? Is it not fitting that the Tsar of all the Russia should have a prince for his valet? Yes! yes. <laughs> and now, Kavinsky, I have heard of Zinya, the daughter of Gudenov. They say that she's very beautiful, that her eyebrows meet, and I'm weary of campaigning. She awaits your majesty in her apartments. Under guard. Mm, you think of everything, Kedinsky. Lead the way. Come, Vasily, my valet. You may carry my sword. Yes, your majesty. And even while Dmitri is claiming the fruits of victory in the apartments of Xenia, his betrothed, the Polish Princess Marina, is on the high road to Moscow to become Dmitri's wife and Empress of the Russians. A few weeks later, they are married. Dmitri tumbled upwards from obscurity to a throne. Tsar at 22 with a princess for a bride forgets many things in the intoxication of his success. Forgets, for instance, the sensibilities of the Russians and more important, the sensibilities of an old man, Prince Shusky. But Prince Shusky has not forgotten. In the dead of night, he meets with a group of boyars in the house of one of the noblemen. The streets full of pagan poles. Mr. Dmitry, this foppish Polish custom. This Polish wife who bears her head in public and wears her gowns cut to the waist. Roman Catholic poles filling our holy cathedrals. Laughing at our customs. Jeering at our sacred icons. Already Dmitry has sent a hundred carts of gold from the Kremlin to the Polish king. A hundred carts? And that is not all. I have heard he means to issue a UK's ordering all Russia to become converted to the pagan faith of Rome. This is too much. If Dmitri on the throne, holy Russia is doomed. He must be removed. On the night of May 17th, 1606, Dmitri and his bride Marina retire early. Lying in the wide bed of the emperor, they drowsily talk, their faces faintly illuminated by the moonlight slowly drawing its silver train across the floor of the apartment. Oh, Dmitri, I love you so much. It should not be difficult to love the emperor of all the Russias. I would not care if you were a Galician, sir. I love you. I loved you since the day I first saw you in my father's palace. And I love you, Marina. In your fashion, I suppose. I understand so little about life. This much I do know. Men and women are different. Before me, you knew many women. After me, there will be many. The first day you entered Moscow, there was Zinya. That is false. Zinya has entered the convent. It's all right, Dmitri. I am not accusing. I am trying to face reality. You see, I am different. You are all I have ever had. All I ever will have. All I want. This moment. These last few days. They cannot last. I know it. I feel it as only a woman can feel. But I shall always remember that brief time. When my Dmitri... Loved only me. Oh, you talk nonsense, Marina. Always there will be just you and I together, ruling this great land, loving as we do tonight. No, it cannot be. I know it. Dmitri, what is that noise? Oh, probably some of my Polish soldiers full of vodka and kvass. No, listen. It's coming closer. Listen, they're coming up the stairs. Dmitri, what is it? I don't know. I... Who's there? Open. Open the door. Who is it? Open the door in the name of the people of Russia. Marina, listen to me. It is ended. Those men have come to kill me. Listen, there's only one thing to do. I'm going through that window. I must get to my soldiers. I must try to come back to you. If I cannot, go to your father. Goodbye, my beloved. No. No, Dmitri, don't leave me. Come back. Come back. And be murdered by a band of peasants? Never. Goodbye. Ah. <laughs> oh. 
Someone just jumped in the bar's window. Oh, oh, on your knees, you are in the presence of the Tsar of Russia. Take it as he was born. What Tsar? The pastor. Set upon him. He must not escape. I cannot escape. I have a broken leg. All the better. No. For God's love, spare me. Do not kill me. Do not kill me. Thus died Tsar Dmitri, naked at the hands of his outraged subjects. Whether he was the true son of Ivan the Terrible remains one of the enigmas of history. On the shores of the Baltic Sea, where the waters of the River Neva roll muddy and cold into the grey gulf of Finland, is Leningrad, the Venice of the North, called first St. Petersburg. And then, during the war, changed to Petrograd. Now, since the revolution, renamed for non-religious Russia's only saint, Nikolai Lenin, father of the USSR. Leningrad is perhaps the most beautiful city in Russia, with luxurious palaces, now converted into workers' living quarters, museums bordering the many canals and beautiful churches facing the broad squares, with the widest streets in Europe radiating across what just a little more than 200 years ago was a marsh on the Neva Delta. In 1703, Peter the Great, having defeated the Swedes, stands on Zyatki Island with a group of officers. Here on this island, I want a fortress built. A strong fortress that may be sure the Swedes will never again set foot on Holy Russia. Yes, Your Majesty. In the center, see that a cathedral is built. Around the island, strong stone walls. But, Your Majesty, there is no stone within a hundred versts of here. Have the stone brought if you have to bring it from Moscow. Now, Menchikov. Yes, Your Majesty. Here on these islands, I will build a city. City? Why, a fortress will keep out any invaders. I want a window from which to look out upon Europe. Your Majesty, a city on this barren marsh? It's incredible. I want a city that Russia can be proud of. Not just overgrown villages like Moscow and Novgorod, but a city like London or Paris. A city that Europe will come to see. You will start work at once. Yes, Your Majesty. Working under conditions so primitive that they carried soil in their hands, the soldiers, spurred by Peter's unflagging energy, built the fortress of Peter and Paul. And Menchikov, the pastry cook whom Peter made a trusted counselor, began the construction of St. Petersburg. But there were constant difficulties. We can get no workmen to come here. They die of the fever in the swamp. They suffer in the cold. Drive them here as many as you need. Drive them here from the provinces. 40,000 a year if you need them. Cities laid out, palaces built, fortresses completed, but no one will come here to live. Or to the nobility to move here from Moscow. I want 1,000 families to build houses here. Order them to bring the stone for their houses with them. I want 2,000 artisans to settle here. See that it is done. Thousands of people have died building the city. They die of disease, of the cold, of the flood. Oh, this is no place for a city. Abandon it. Abandon a paradise? Ten for more workmen. Drive them from the farthest corner of the empire. What does the cost matter? We are building the most beautiful city on earth, St. Petersburg. The cost was 100,000 lives. But within a few years, Peter the Great had accomplished a feat of construction that could be compared to the Great Wall of China and the Great Pyramid of Egypt. For hundreds of years, the story of Russia was the story of the court, the chronicle of the Tsars. The people, the millions who lived in superstitious stupor, knew nothing but toil, poverty, and the solace of vodka and the Holy Church. They were serfs, owned in perpetuity by the nobility. This feudal society lasted 400 years longer in Russia than in the rest of Europe. But at last, in 1861, Tsar Alexander freed the serfs. This freedom meant little to the peasants. In the cities, it was different. Industry was gradually coming to Russia. Great factories were rising in St. Petersburg and Moscow. Workers, freed from serfdom, became more and more conscious of their class. Then, on a Sunday more than 30 years ago, occurred an incident which was to affect profoundly the most backward peasant in the farthest corner of the empire. A few days before the fateful Sunday, 
Tsar Nicholas II is going over state papers with an official of the court. Dear Your Majesty, is a communication I feel you should know about. Mm, what is it? It is in connection with the workers' strike at the Putilov Iron Works. Oh, that matter. It's most annoying. Well, what does this say? Who is it from? It is from Gapon, the priest. He asks that you meet a deputation of workers here at the palace on Sunday. Oh, I have nothing to say to them. What is this priest, a nihilist? No, Your Majesty. The secret police report that he is a social worker and is the head of the Association of Russian Factory and Mill Workers. Mm, these workers, I don't understand them. Here I have all the worry of the war with Japan and they have to go on a strike. It's very upsetting. What will you do about this petition? Will you meet them? Oh, I was planning to go to Sarkoe Salo on Sunday. I need a rest. Your grandfather met a similar deputation of workers in 1878. Yes, and accordingly set a bad precedent. Should I give orders for the demonstration to be stopped? Oh, I don't know. I, I'm i tired. You do whatever you please about it. Nothing was done about it. And accordingly, on Sunday, January 22nd, 1905, 100,000 workers, led by the priest Gipon, began their march on the empty Winter Palace. For the vacillating Tsar had gone to the Summer Palace and left no instructions. The procession is orderly. The workers are unarmed. They carry no revolutionary flags, but instead religious banners and portraits of the Tsar and the royal family. Chanting hymns, they parade to the city and approach the Winter Palace, before which a strengthened guard of Cossacks stand. The officer of the guard and his adjutant, bewildered, consider the situation. They're coming to the square now, sir. What are your orders? They haven't been given any. There are thousands of them. The garrison here is not very large. My permanent instructions are to permit no one to enter the palace grounds without proper credentials. Then shall we fire upon them? If they attempt to enter the palace, it may be necessary. On toward the palace, across the open square, marched the chanting workers, peaceably carrying their icons of the Tsar. Suddenly, as they approached the palace gate, the Cossacks began firing. Amidst indescribable confusion, the ranks of the workers split in terror as they flee to cover. In a moment, the square is deserted, save for 500 men, women, and children who lie dead upon the newly fallen snow, and 3,000 more writhing in agony of their wounds. This bloody Sunday in 1905, more than any other single thing, crystallized the revolutionary forces in Russia. From this day, indeed, the Russian Revolution may be said to have begun. The outraged and disillusioned people, disgusted with the excesses of the czaristic regime, grew more and more class conscious. So demoralized did the nation finally become that it was impossible for Russia to keep an army in the field during the World War. When, by the spring of 1917, more than two million soldiers had deserted, Tsar Nicholas abdicated. The revolution was now in progress. Kerensky the Menshevik held sway for a few brief months and then fell before the Bolshevik forces of Lenin and Trotsky. By 1918, the Red Army was fighting a battle for existence against a half dozen white armies of royalist Russians reinforced by allied troops. In July, one of these armies has almost surrounded the town of Ekaterinburg in the Ural Mountains. The revolutionary government finally is forced to take its most decisive step. A telegram is dispatched from Moscow to Ekaterinburg which sends a young red soldier to a modest little house near the center of the city. The house where for several months the Tsar and his family have lived as private individuals. Nicholas Romanov, you are instructed to gather with your family at number 16 Orlov Street tonight at 8 o'clock. Why? What is to happen to us? It is necessary to move you. Disturbances have broken out through the town and they might endanger your person. You'll be taken under guard this evening to 16 Orlov Street and from there will be transported by automobile to more safe quarters. Be prepared to leave here by 8 o'clock. Very well. At 8 o'clock, a guard appears and leads the Tsar, the Tsarina and their five children to the building at 16 Orlov Street. They are led into a low ceiling guard room in the basement. In the dim light, the Empress and Emperor of all the Russias find seats. The children gather around, staring with frightened eyes at the cold faces of the several red soldiers in the room. The Tsar reassuringly grasps the Tsarina's hand. 
She turns to him. Nicky, I don't like this. I, I'm afraid. It's all right, Alex. Don't be worried. It's oh, all right. This horrible peasant. So insolent. So dirty. Nicholas I... Romanov, it is my duty to inform you that your presence and that of your family is a threat to the Third International. Should your friends who are nearing the city succeed in rescuing you, it would be a very dangerous blow to our cause. Therefore, you have been sentenced by the Committee of Workers and Peasants to be shot. Oh, oh, me, but spare the children and the emperor. The existence of a single Romanov is a danger we cannot risk. Spare no, the children for the love of God. Ah, the oh, let the children live. Holy mother of God. Ah, no, 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 no. Ah. Ah. Today, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, born in the violent death agonies of old Russia, presents the world with the interesting phenomenon of the first planned state. Only when the boys and girls of today, who have been raised in a society which minimizes the family relationship in favor of a social relationship, have grown to maturity and are in control of their society's destiny, will the world know whether communism has been the right thing for Russia. Until then, if we look upon her without prejudice, Russia is the most interesting phenomenon in modern times, and without doubt, one of the great nations of the world. I invite you to join us again next week at this time as we journey to another of the world's fascinating ports of call.